that is there is no reason for that. <laughs> so um, this is just to open up the message. There once was an Illinois man who left the snow-filled streets of Chicago for a vacation in Florida. His wife was on a business trip and was planning to meet him there the next day. When he reached his hotel, he decided to send his wife a quick email. Unable to find a scrap of paper on which he had written her email address, he tried to the best of his ability to remember it from memory. Unfortunately, he missed one letter and his note was directed instead of, to an, instead of his wife, it was sent to an elderly preacher's wife whose husband just passed away one day before. When the grieving widow had checked her email, she took one look at the monitor and left out a piercing scream and fainted on the floor. At the sound, her family rushed into the room and saw the note on the screen, and this is what it read. Dearest wife, just got checked in. Everything is prepared for your arrival tomorrow. Signed, your eternally loving husband. Oh, by the way, it's really hot down here. <laughs> I don't know if you ever done send a text message to the wrong person or an email. We all have those stories and we could have that confession, but not for today. And the point of the story is uh, don't send an email to the wrong person. This doesn't have much to do with the message today, but I want to speak to you uh, on the topic of drowning doubt. I've read a statistic that 70% of high schoolers, when they finish high school, walk away from church. And only after they finish their university or after they finish their college, that they come back, only 40% will come back to church. One of the 10 reasons one blogger said that people walk away from church, young people, is that they live in church, they walk in church, and many people have doubts that many times are not dealt with, but they are suppressed. But when you go to college, you are taught to magnify, to question everything you believe, and to deal with your doubts. And many people were never equipped of how to deal with their doubts. And I believe today, by the word of God, we'll be able to learn at least a little bit of how to deal and how to grow and overcome our doubts in Jesus' name. Amen. See, we can drown our doubts or we can drown in our doubts. It's our choice. The greatest people in the Bible, including Abraham, who's known to be the father of faith, struggled with doubt. We see people like also Zechariah, who has an angel come to him in the temple and he's scared to death and he has the audacity to question the angel's voice. Sometimes you read these stories, you're like, you're kidding me. And they had doubt. We see people like uh, Philip who hears about Jesus and says, can anything good come out of Jesus, out of Nazareth? We see people like Peter walking on the water. We see people like Thomas. We see many people in the Bible who were great pillars of faith, yet they, they struggled with doubt. Someone says that the people who don't have doubt are people who don't believe in anything. But then you have to doubt that too. We will all have doubts. We just have to learn to overcome them and to challenge them. God understands our doubts. God is not judging us for our doubts. But at the same time, in the scripture, God made it very clear that he does not endorse doubts. When Jesus said that if we speak to this mountain and he said, if you have faith, and he mentioned this, and do not doubt, then it will be done according to your faith. James said, when you pray to God for wisdom, make sure you pray with faith. And he says, if a man doubts, make sure he knows He's not going to receive anything from God. So God takes the issue of doubt pretty serious. And I think we should as well. Now there's a difference between doubt and unbelief. Doubt is between faith and unbelief. But doubt is not unbelief. Unbelief is completely opposite. When people do not even want to know God and they, they just made their hearts are hard. They don't want to be with God. They don't want to have God in their life. It's kind of like, you know, people who went into the airplane and shot the pilot and the guy came out of the cab and says, hey guys, party time, freedom time, the pilot is dead. We're free to do what we want. Yeah, and free to die. <laughs> that's, that's unbelief. Or like an, uh, a guy who was riding in, in, in a wilderness and stopped for a for dinner and picked out his three sandwiches and took the the lamp you know lit up the uh, lit up the, the atmosphere around him took a sandwich to the lamp and sees a worm in the in the sandwich threw the sandwich out 
takes the second sandwich, put it, puts it to the lamp, sees the worm in it, throws the sandwich out, takes the third sandwich, breaks the lamp and eats the sandwich. And that's kind of how many people are. When you realize that you don't want to deal with your sin, you're like, you know what? I don't believe in this. Not because there's not enough evidence, because it requires me to change. I'll rather live without light so I can live the sandwich kind of life that I want. And so that's what people usually have. Let me give you just the three differences between doubt and unbelief as a way of introduction. Doubt says, I can't believe because I don't have enough evidence. Unbelief says, I won't believe in spite of evidence. Doubt says, you know what, I need some more evidence. I need some more confirmation. Can you, can you guide me in this? Can you show me? That's doubt. But unbelief says, I don't give a rip about the evidence. I don't care about the miracles. I don't believe in all of this stuff, okay? Even if this will be real, it's still wrong. Why? Because it has to be wrong. All of that demon stuff speaking, it has to be wrong. It's, it's not right. All these miracles, that's just not right. All the resurrection of the dead, no, this is not right. Even if it will happen right in front of your eyes, you will still ignore it. Why? Because your heart is sick. It happened right in front of Pharisees' eyes and they still denied it. Thomas, he doubted, but the moment he saw the evidence, he says, oh my God. Pharisees saw the evidence and they still said, oh, disciples stole him. Why? Because their heart was one of unbelief. Doubt says, I can't believe because I don't have evidence. Unbelief says, I won't believe in spite of evidence. Doubt is honest. Unbelief is stubborn. Doubt is honest. Doubt is like Nicodemus coming at night to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm kind of scared coming to you during the day because people will see me. But I have some questions. I know you must be from God, but I got some questions. But unbelief is stubborn. It's like Pharaoh. No matter how many miracles God will do, he still will not believe in him. And miracles will not change an unbeliever. No amount of miracles. God can show all of the stuff an unbeliever inside needs to be convicted by the Holy Spirit and changed by His power. And needs to repent of the hardness of His sin. The third thing about doubt and unbelief is doubt is looking for light. Unbelief is content living in darkness. A doubter is constantly looking for light. A person in unbelief is content living in darkness. A doubter is not someone who is content living in darkness. It's someone who is looking for the light. And I want to challenge you today. It's good sometimes when a young person goes through the seasons of doubt. As long as they're looking for light. And God will always be there to show his light to the person. But when a person becomes an unbeliever. When a person becomes hardened in his heart. That's the offense, the heart of God. Would somebody say amen with me? If you have your Bible, let's go together to book of John chapter 20 book of John chapter 20 and verses 25 and verses 27. We'll just read two verses. These are very famous verses. Book of John chapter 20 verses 25 and verses 27. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Thomas, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side I will not believe that's doubt 27 verse 27 then Jesus when ready Jesus came in and Jesus said to Thomas reach your finger here and put into my hands reach your hand here and put it into my side do not be unbelieving but believing and we just have to read one more verse. And Thomas answered and said to him, my Lord and my God. Thomas was overjoyed. This is the second time that Jesus came to his disciples and he showed himself after his resurrection. The first time that Jesus came, the Bible says the disciples were shot together in the room for the fear of the Jews. And Jesus comes to the disciples first time. This is the second, but the first time Jesus comes, and he says, peace. You know, this is where the peace came from. He came and he greeted them with peace and disciples were all surprised, shocked and Jesus begins to roll his sleeves not to show them his muscles but to show them his scars. You would assume the king of all kings, the maker of heaven and the earth, the prince of peace, the everlasting father, the great I am, the alpha, the omega 
wouldn't be showing scars. He would show his stars. He would show some power. But a great general is showing his scars. I applied for a scholarship in CBC today. And one of the things that they ask you on the scholarship application is to mention all of the honors that you have achieved throughout your high school years. I have the tendency of archiving everything. So I went to my folder and I found out I was actually a really good student. I checked a lot of honors that I received. I'm like, where did I get those from? When I spoke to uh, a 9-11 at 2002 in front of four and a half thousand people at the, at the track stadium and just did a verse from Revelation, I got an honor for that. So I keep listing all of these things. One thing they will never ask you for a scholarship application is to mention your scars. They will not ask you to mention your troubles, your tribulations. And when Apostle Paul would write to Corinthians and others, he would say, hey, the proof of my apostleship is not even the miracles, but he said, my scars are the proof of who I am. Someone said, if you want to impress people, tell them about your strengths. But if you want to truly impact them, tell them your weaknesses. Jesus comes in and starts the introduction, revealing his scars. Do you know why we don't show our scars to others? Not because we've never been hurt, but because we've never been healed. Life has enough hurt to each one of us. You don't have to be Jesus to be crucified sometimes. And you don't have to live in the Roman Empire to have hurts in life. And the reason why many times we are afraid to show our scars is because we don't have any. Because the only thing we have is wounds. The difference between a wound and a scar is the wound says, I've been hurt. A scar says, I've been healed. A wound says, look what people have done to me. But a scar says, look what God has done to me. A wound says, you know what? I've been neglect neglected. I've been rejected. I've been sold by my brothers. They have spat on me and nailed me to the cross. But a scar says, but the Spirit of God raised me on the third day. And I'm here and alive and well. The scars say, Jesus, I think, modeled to his disciples, guys, throughout your life as preaching the gospel, you will be persecuted, you will be hated, and people will think by killing you, they're serving God. But remember, after all of those scars and all of those bleeding, I can heal that and make that into a scar. And scar is always a testimony. But a wound is a pain. A wound reveals the depth of our pain, but the scar reveals the depth of God's power. Let me just give you a small tip. Never show your wounds to people because they will spit on it. But when you show your wounds to God, He heals it. But never show your scars to God because people need to see your scars. So their faith can be built and encouraged in Jesus' mighty name. Can somebody say amen? And that's what Jesus does with His disciples. Another thing that we have to remember about our wounds is that a wound that's neglected is a wound that becomes infected. A wound that's neglected is a wound that becomes infected. The worst thing about wounds is they are open to infection. Anytime you have a wound and you don't treat it, you don't put a bandaid on it, and you don't disinfect it, something will happen to it, is that wound is not as dangerous as the sicknesses that wound attracts to your body. That wound that's not treated but neglected, it doesn't just remain a wound, it becomes a sickness and eventually it begins to kill your life. Every pain that in our life is not treated becomes a fuel for our sin and becomes a fuel for demonic activity in our lives. Many times Satan keeps looking for wounds because like a fly, he looks for fresh blood that he can put his infection on. And that's why Jesus wants to heal our wounds and churn, churn our wounds into scars and our scars into stars. For his glory. Can somebody say praise the Lord? I want to challenge you today to allow Jesus to heal your wounds. Remember time helps but only Jesus heals. People say in this world time heals, time doesn't heal. Time helps but only Jesus heals. Only Jesus heals. There was a woman who was following Jesus and the Bible says that according to her ceremony she was unclean. And she was not unclean because she was a prostitute. She was not unclean because she did really bad things. She was unclean for one reason, because she was bleeding. Anytime as a Christian you are bleeding, you will be unclean. It's a matter of time that a person who carries pain he doesn't deal with will fall into smoking, will fall into pornography, 
will fall into sexual promiscuity, will fall into bitterness, hatred or any other sin because bleeding brings uncleanness. Bleeding makes you unclean and the goal is not to become clean. This woman did not look to get a new status called clean. She was looking to stop the bleeding because she knew if I stop the bleeding, the uncleanness will go away. And many people today make New Year's resolutions that I want to stop smoking. I want to stop drinking. My friend, that's great. But you have to find sometimes, is your uncleanness a cause of bleeding, hatred, bitterness, a wound that you carry? If that bleeding is not stopped, your uncleanness will never be a reality. A bleeding has to be stopped. And that bleeding can be stopped when we reach out to Jesus. In the honesty, say, Jesus, I am hurting, I am bleeding, but I know that you bled so I can stop bleeding. I know you died so I can live for your glory and then we can become clean once again for Jesus' glory. Can somebody say amen? If you ever had a bruise on your body or you had a bleeding on your body and you put a new shirt, white shirt on it, your white shirt will be stained. The goal is not to get a new shirt. The goal is to stop the bleeding. You can keep getting new shirts but at the same time if that bleeding doesn't stop, your shirt will be continuously getting stained and this woman realized my secret is to find and to stop the bleeding. Many times when talking to guys who struggle with pornography or, or guys who even with drugs, many times inside there's a deep pain, deep bitterness, deep hatred toward parents. And until a young man and a young woman does not let go of the bitterness and unforgiveness, that hatred, honestly, they can make all the New Year's resolutions and go to all the rehab clubs and all of these things, all of these things are great, but the root that fuels the sin is pain because it opens the door for demonic influence and demonic infection. Wounds that are neglected are the wounds that are infected. But Jesus heals. Time helps, but Jesus heals. Time helps, but Jesus heals. Can somebody say amen? And we see that first time Jesus comes, he reveals his scars. And Jesus wants us also to have scars. I'm not saying to go get hurt, you already did. But Jesus says he wants to heal you of the hurts you already have. So you can be a testimony and you can also come and say, hey guys, I got some scars as well. The second time Jesus comes to see his disciples, the Bible says he comes for one purpose. He comes for one person and he comes for one reason. He comes for Thomas. He comes for a man who eight days before missed a discipleship meeting. I'm not sure what John, what Thomas had important going on in his life. I'm not sure if Thomas looked at the disciples, he's like, you know what, I know what they're going to do there. They're going to cry about the fact that Jesus got died and they're going to shut the doors and cry and whine. And you know what, I'm sick and tired of those meetings. I'm going to miss today and sleep and watch some football in Jerusalem. Or maybe, John, maybe Thomas said, I'm going to go fishing. I just don't have time for that discipleship meeting. Little did Thomas know by missing that discipleship meeting, he was meeting the greatest meeting in the world. When he missed that meeting, the Bible says the next day Thomas started to doubt that Jesus rose from the dead. Where did the doubt come from? Missing a meeting. Doubt feeds on isolation. When we start missing church, whatever the reasons are, when we start missing the gathering of the saints together, even if the meeting is, you, you know, you're like, I know what the message is going to be because Vlad posted on Facebook. I know what the songs will be because Bryson sent me three days ago. And I know who will be there, who will not be. Nothing ordinary will be there, my friend. But let me tell you about people who miss church. Sooner or later, they begin to discover doubt is there. Why do I question this now, what I didn't question? Why do I have a hard time believing this, what I didn't believe before? And how come now the same people who miss the church are gathering with their buddies who are drowning in doubt and sooner or later you find yourself like Thomas saying, I don't believe this no more. Why? Because you're missing church. You may say, can that make a big difference? It made in Thomas's life. The 11 disciples never doubted because they were together. Jesus comes when we are together. To remove doubt, we have to remove isolation. Sitting at home and praying to Jesus and saying it's me and Jesus actually can get you depressed and suicidal. You need to come to church. You need to make a church priority. And you need to gather with believers who will foster and encourage and strengthen your faith. Can somebody say amen? Are we going to gather together? We already gathered together. So I want to say thank you because doubt is going to be broken down of your life in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.
And so we see that Thomas comes to the place. He's doubting, but he's not missing this meeting. He's showing up at the meeting. And Jesus comes to Thomas and begins to say, Thomas, i got to talk to you. And before we read what Jesus says to Thomas, I want to read what God said to Israel in Isaiah. If you have your Bible, you can go to Isaiah. Just one more chapter, one more uh, Bible passage that I will read today. Isaiah 49 and verse 14 and 15. Isaiah 49 and verse 14. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. My God has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, but I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. How to overcome doubt? We see that we don't have to miss the gathering of the saints. But the second truth, how to overcome doubt, is that we have to constantly be aware of the marks that God leaves on our lives. When John the Baptist struggled with doubt, we see that Jesus told John the Baptist, not just some prophetic messianic promises in the Bible, but he tells John the Baptist, go tell John of the things you've seen, the miracles you've seen. You see how I leave marks on people's lives. Go tell John of the fingerprints of God on people's lives and let John's doubt go away. Anytime you have a moment of doubt, instead of talking to your feelings, instead of Googling, or go into your professor or talking to your friends who don't know what they're talking about. What you have to do is you have to shut up and think, what did God do in my life? You have to go back and maybe wipe the dust of the events that have been long forgotten and see the marks that God has left on your life. When maybe your parents were told you were supposed to be dead, you were not supposed to be born, but you were born. Maybe like I have my brother Andre who at a young age he fell from a second floor and I was watching that head down into a concrete and blood gushed through his eyes, through his ears, everywhere. I saw that right in front of me. He was supposed to not live but God left a mark on him that day. Maybe the time when you got baptized in the Holy Spirit and you remember that moment and you know it was a mark of God on your life. Maybe the time where God healed you or God stepped in or you were supposed to die or whatever. God always has in each one of our lives, He left fingerprints in our life. Just when the moment of doubt comes in, we can wipe the dust from our past and say, God was here. I know He's alive. David did that in front of Goliath. When Samuel wasn't there, when Saul did not encourage him, when the Goliath looked really, really big and David looked really, really small and David did not have a prophetic word. David did not have a dream a night before where Samuel told him in a dream to go kill the Goliath. David only wiped the dust of his past and he saw the tracks of God and he says, listen, God was there with me. He's there with me right now. I'm going to go just on the fact he was with me yesterday. Never forget God's goodness in your life because that will help you to overcome your doubt. But the third thing, which is very vital, and what God did to Thomas and what God tells us in Isaiah. Not only we have to remember the marks God left on our life. God wants us to remember the marks we left on God. Jesus came to Thomas. And Jesus did not tell Thomas, Thomas, do you remember all the miracles I've done to you? Jesus says, Thomas, put your fingers into the scars you placed in my body. And when Thomas did that, the Bible says, he says, oh my God, oh my God, oh my Lord. And God says in Isaiah, Isaiah quotes Israel saying, God, you've forgotten us. You don't love us. You don't care about us. And God says, can a mother forget her nursing child? Even if she does, I can't forget you. And then this is where God says, see, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. When I was in school and I needed to remember something. And we did not use calendars or a notification app on the iPhone. We did not have anything, any notes that we took. What we did is we were smart. We took a pen and wrote it on our hand. Because this is a sure way to remember it for at least three days. Because it took a while for that to wash off. And we didn't wash our hands a lot. <laughs> God says, I did not write you with a pencil on my hands. I inscribed you on my hands. Anytime in heaven, heaven gets busy. And you think I forget about you. Anytime I look at my hands, I remember you. 
when you look at your life remember me when you see my marks in your life because I will remember you when I see yours on my body when you look at your life never forget my marks on your life because I left a mark on your life because when I look at my hands I will never forget the marks you left on my body the marks I let you leave on my body I will never forget you God says I want to remind you today how to drown your doubt remember the marks God left on your life remember the marks you left on his and that's what God did to Thomas he said Jesus touch my marks touch my scars touch my side and when Thomas did that his doubts drowned amen in the conclusion when Peter was drowning in his doubt and Jesus was walking close can you imagine trusting someone to walk on water and you started to do that and you realize it's not working what would you do probably swim away from him if Jesus is walking and you tried walking toward him and it didn't work you wouldn't swim closer to him you would be like I'm running away from you sir because whatever you just told me I almost killed myself trying to do what you told me Peter did not swim away from Jesus Peter cried out in the midst of his doubt Jesus help me I remember talking to one gentleman who says I am doubting God I am doubting the Christianity and I said did you talk to God about it he says how can I talk to someone I'm doubting John the Baptist did when John the Baptist doubted Jesus he didn't go to Pharisees to get the latest gossip on Jesus he went to the very man he doubted and say I am doubting you and Jesus says let me deal with that when John when Peter was doubting Jesus he screamed to the very man he doubted and the very man he doubted stretched his hand and says why did you doubt me and picked him up my friend God wants to help our doubts I love what TB Joshua always says God does not mind your doubt if in the midst of it you seek answer from him if your doubt causes you to run away from God your doubt will turn into unbelief and will turn you into someone that you would never wish to be but if in your doubt you will do like the father of a demon possessed boy said Jesus I believe but help my unbelief if in your doubt confusion you will say Jesus I am drowning please help me he will never abandon you if in your doubt you will send disciples to Jesus say Jesus are you the one Jesus will not send you what the heck are you doubting me Jesus will give you the evidence that you need to strengthen your faith and to remove your doubt you're gonna either drown in your doubt or you're gonna drown your doubt Jesus has given us enough tools to do that today in Jesus mighty name the message that I spoke today it did not come because I was reading the Bible and I thought of a really cool idea over the last few years particularly a few months I've met more young people who used to be on fire for God who don't believe in God or let's say correctly they doubt him some stopped going to church and those people that some I knew very personally and I discipled and one thing that I realized is sometimes we talk to Christianese but when you start going to school and you start taking classes where people start challenging your worldview and they start saying things to you like your parents believe that's why you believe but if you would have been born Muslim you probably would have been Muslim and there's a lot of other people and don't, who, what makes you think that this is the only faith that is right and people begin to question their faith and when they doubt they feel like they committed sin and they run from God they don't know Peter doubted and still was rescued they don't know John doubted and still was rescued and Jesus called him the greatest prophet they don't know Thomas doubted and still was disciple of Jesus Christ they don't know Abraham doubted and still was the father of faith they don't know Zacharias doubted and still had John the Baptist they don't know that I doubted and sometimes I still do but in my doubt I don't go bull, 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 on the bottom I said Jesus help me and he's always there to help me if you are here you will have moments of doubt I want to challenge you today to look at the track record of your life that God has left for you and secondly look at the record look at the scars you left on him never isolate yourself and in the moment of your deepest doubt never run from God even if you feel like how can I talk to him whom I doubt remember he doesn't doubt your existence he believes you exist and he believes you're worthy enough to die for you he will always be there to understand the doubt but he never tolerated unbelief amen
Let's close our eyes and we're going to pray. Lord, I thank you for your word and I thank you that you gave yourself for us. I thank you for the scars on your hands. I thank you for the scars on your side. And Lord, I thank you for the precious young people that are sitting here, for the youth, for those who are in college and those who are in high school or even in middle school. I ask you, Lord God, that you give them the strength today and I pray that this message will go deep in their spirit. Even after this service, that they will never be forgotten, God. That when they find themselves in the sea of doubt, that they will not swim away from you, but they will swim towards you, Jesus, and scream on the top of their lungs, help me, Jesus, and that your hand will rescue them. I pray for those who are right now doubting like John the Baptist, maybe sitting in their situation and they're doubting your promises, they're doubting your ability to see them through, Lord. I pray that they will reflect on your goodness in their life, that they will reflect on the track record, Lord, on the marks you left on them and on the marks they left on you. Strengthen our faith. We believe, Lord, but help our, our unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's take time right now to break into our groups.